for just a quick warning before I hit the start button. The session ends at the top of the hour. You'll get two minutes to run and then it shuts us down because the next group is queuing up. Okay. <coughs> okay, I'm gonna get hit the start button and you're on first, Susan. Hi, welcome to today's conference. Um, I wanted to start with a quick moment of silence for those that were executed and killed in Mozambique yesterday. And we want to recognize that um, some of this is due to resettlement issues, which we are going to be talking about indigenous rights and large scale mines quickly. But a moment of silence for those that were killed. This is a, um, an area that uh, Gemfields has been mining rubies. There's also oil interest. And it is, um, we just are very, very sorry for the loss of the people in this region. Thank you. Andrea, I'll let you introduce our uh, speakers today. And this is an important topic, an important panel. Thank you. All right, so following on the, um, we hope everybody had a chance to watch the, the movie that was played yesterday um, and the day before, talking about the very specific examples of what happened to a person dealing with that, uh, protecting her own land rights. And now this panel is going to go into a deeper dive about the topic. So our panel um, moderator is Jennifer Krill. Jennifer heads Earthworks, which is a US-based grassroots and policy group working to empower communities and protect the environment from the impacts of extractive industries. We also have Nuskmata from the Sekwepan and Nuhal Indigenous modern day British Columbia, Canada. She's been working with First Nation communities on the Central Coast and Northern Interior of BC as a community organizer. Um, and she's a research and self government coordinator regarding First Nations peoples. And we have Peter Fight with the World Re um, Resources Institute. He's the director of the Land and Resource Rights Initiative. So these are our panelists. Today, Jennifer, I'm going to turn it over to you and get out of the way. And we're here to support you guys if you need us. Thank you so much, Andrea. Thank you, Susan, um, for that acknowledgement at the beginning of the panel. Um, it's really important for for um, jewelers and people who are interested in sustainability um, when it comes to mining to understand the global dimensions and the human as well as the environmental impacts of these of these mined minerals. You know, the reality is that um, most consumers don't know where the gold in their products comes from. They don't know where minerals in their products come from, whether it's a piece of jewelry or, a, a, you know, a piece of technology. Um, the reality is that mining and gold mining in particular, um, is one of the most destructive industries in the world in countries that keep track of toxic releases, um, such as in the US, mining is the number one toxic industry. Um, mining can displace communities, um, uh, the human rights abuses that Susan um, led with in Mozambique are not unique. Mining contaminates drinking water, sometimes in perpetuity forever. It hurts workers um, as well as empowers workers. It's a double-edged sword in many communities. And mining destroys pristine environments. Um, there, we often say at Earthworks, there's no such thing as sustainable mining or responsible mining. You can make it more responsible, but at the end of the day, you are you are causing a permanent impact on the landscape. Um, and the health impacts, you know, mining pollutes water um, and landscapes with mercury, with cyanide, um, and that has lasting impacts on people and health, um, uh, and the health of ecosystems. So, you know, a statistic we often use is that it's that producing enough gold for one ring generates 20 tons of waste in the landscape. 
And later, Nismap is going to tell you about one of the impacts of dealing, one of the key impacts that it can occur, a tragic impact that occur when we're dealing with that waste. Um, we also can talk a little bit about uh, inroads being made to help um, secure more responsible mined minerals. But before we get to that, um, I want to start with our first panelist, who is Peter Veit. Um, and Peter, um, uh, I hope that the technology works for us today with the weather situation um, and the internet situation. But Peter uh, at World Resources Institute has terrific maps of what's going on with mining around the world and it, how it intersects with indigenous peoples. So Peter, I hope you would tell us a little bit about the global story. Great. Uh, so uh, thank you, Jennifer. Um, I suspect um, I don't need to tell you all that mining is expanding in many places around the world in large measure because of uh, rising mineral demand, higher prices, uh, new government incentives and, and other measures. The, uh, as Jennifer just mentioned, the price of gold, for example, hit a record high of over $2,000 uh, an ounce in, in early August, uh, partly because of the uh, pandemic. Um, as mining expands, uh, more of it extends into indigenous and community land. And when I say uh, community land, I mean land that is collectively held uh, and governed by a community, whether it is recognized by statutory law or not. Uh, experts around the world uh, believe that about uh, half of the world, uh, half of the world's land is community land. It's found in all continents except Antarctica uh, with the greatest amount uh, in Africa, but we also find it in Europe uh, and in the US. Um, perhaps more important, uh, this land sustains up to 3 billion people uh, in the world. Historically, uh, there was actually much more community land, uh, but this land over time has been taken by governments, by local elites, uh, by companies, and in some cases, community leaders have subdivided and individualized the community land into private property. Most community land is governed uh, by traditional leaders under customary tenure arrangements, uh, but only about 10% of the world's land is legally recognized as belonging to communities, and much less of that land is uh, recorded uh, in a government cadaster uh, and documented with a certificate uh, or a title. And that means uh, most community land is not legally secure and is under threat to be taken. Um, we know from research uh, that in many places, community land uh, is managed in a sustainable way. Uh, research that my organization, WRI, uh, mm -hmm several years ago found that the average annual deforestation rate on indigenous lands in the Bolivian, Peruvian, Peruvian Brazilian, and Colombian Amazon are two to three times lower uh, than in similar land not managed by indigenous people. And other research uh, from around the world, especially in Latin America and Asia, found similar results. Uh, these findings obviously have significant implications for climate change. We know about a quarter uh, of all greenhouse gas emissions come from deforestation and other land use changes. And we know that community land holds at least 22% of the world's forest carbon and about 17% of the total carbon. That includes uh, carbon uh, found in the soil. Um, of concern uh, is that uh, a number of studies are showing that the threats to community land can quickly undermine uh, the good work of communities and manage their, their land in a sustainable way. Uh, we just released uh, last month a report uh, that looks specifically at mining on indigenous lands in the Amazon. And there are a number of things that I just wanted to highlight uh, uh, going forward. One is that legal and illegal mining, which is uh, expanding significantly, covers more than 20% of the indigenous lands in the Amazon. Uh, we also learned that indigenous land with mining activities have more tree cover loss 
than those without mining. In Bolivia, in Ecuador, in Peru, forest loss was at least three times higher on indigenous territories with mining operations than those without, and one to two times higher in Colombia and in Venezuela. Uh, national laws in these countries recognize uh, indigenous land rights, but very few mineral rights. Uh, they recognize mineral rights for subsistence, domestic, uh, and customary purpose purposes, but not for commercial purposes. That requires a separate authorization. All countries recognize the right of consultation, but only in Guyana do indigenous people have a very limited form of consent, which is uh, inner form. Uh, only in Colombia do indigenous people have the right of first refusal over commercial mining on their land. And that government is now beginning to draw up simplified procedures for indigenous people to acquire uh, commercial mineral rights. Uh, in practice, uh, before, uh, just as I finish, uh, in practice, we know that in a lot of these uh, uh, remote areas, the law is not particularly well implemented by miners, and it is not particularly well enforced by governments. Uh, indigenous people, therefore, have had to employ various strategies, uh, such as litigation to try to protect their lands. In Colombia, for example, indigenous people uh, requested the government for their land to be established as a national park, in part because mining is not allowed in parks. That's a major concession because it limits the use that indigenous people can have of their land. Uh, let me finish then by just saying there's a number of recommendations uh, that we put forward in our report that would better balance the power uh, between governments, companies, and IPs. Um, there's a need to strengthen the legal protections. There's a need to strengthen social and environmental safeguards. There's a need to build the capacity of indigenous people to better protect themselves and their lands when they advocate for their rights. Uh, we need to ensure that all mining is done in a safe way. Uh, thank you very much. I'll pass it back uh, to Jennifer. Thank you, Peter. That's a um, harrowing overview. Um, I, I, I can't tell you how lucky you all are to have Nisk Mata here um, today, um, a, a dear friend and um, uh, uh, one of the um, leading individuals in, um, um, in what we call Canada. Um, in, helping to face down the threats of industrial extraction. Ms. Mata, I hope you can tell us a little bit of what that struggle is like um, from the perspective of the land. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, so um, I'll just begin by saying that I'm, I'm coming to you today from my homeland of Sukhlet Uluk and um, I'm here in my mother's territory this morning with all of you, and I'm, I'm glad that I have this opportunity to speak on this important topic. Um, I'm gonna share a story about gold and the impact of gold on my life and my community and how those, this is not a, a, a you know, individual or original story at all, but impacts so many. Um, so I'm from, from the Sukhothan people in the interior of modern day British Columbia. And I'm also from the Nukhal people from the coastal, central coast of modern day British Columbia. And um, the history of uh, our people really um, is intertwined very closely with the gold rush of the 1850s. Um, of course, it started earlier in California, moved up into British Columbia, and then moved up into, um, you know, to the Yukon and to the big Klondike and, and up into Alaska. Um, the gold rush is, uh, it was such a, a, a monumental event in our history because it brought so many people in such a compressed amount of time into our territories. Um, our trade, established trade routes, all of our civilizations, you know, all of our um, very complex stratified societies that um, were existing um, uh, before the time of contact were heavily impacted by the gold rush because 
what happened at the same time is that diseases came in and decimated 90 to 100 percent of our population in different areas. We have villages that were completely wiped out because of the gold rush. Um, this gold fever that was sweeping through the land was happening in a different way in our communities because the gold fever was coming in the form of smallpox and measles and there was um, massive death. Um, and if you can imagine being at a family dinner where you have 10 people sitting around the table and maybe one person survives, you have an idea of what the impacts were in the communities, in the families from um, the impacts of the gold rush. Um, and this, so this story is going back pre-1850s, um, fast forward to August 4th, 2014, in Sukhlepan Ulu territory, Imperial Metals Mount Pauli mine, the, the dam breaches. 26 million cubic meters of mining waste comes down the mountain, scouring down through the waterways into Quinell Lake. This is the time when the, the salmon are coming through. This is a spawning area for the salmon. It's one of the largest sources of clean water in our territory. It's, a, it's an interior rainforest, which is very special on its own. So we have um, all kinds of medicines and foods that we, that we take from that area that we can't get anywhere else in our territory. It impacts one third of British Columbia through the Fraser watershed, um, impacts indigenous peoples all along the river, impacts communities all along the way, farming communities, um, sport fishers, uh, tourism operators in this entire watershed. Um, there was basically no consequence to Imperial Metals Mount Poly Mine for that disaster. Um, there were legal cases brought against them that were taken over by the Crown and dismissed. Um, there was no type of um, fines that were levied. The only thing that came was a, a pollution abatement order, which basically is the government saying stop polluting the water. Um, so we, we're dealing with a very um, powerful uh, corporate structure. Uh, the foundation of uh, colonialism, the foundation of the laws in British Columbia are founded on the gold rush law era of the 1850s. And you think of how they were doing mining in the 1850s with gold pans and sluices. Um, you know, it was much smaller scale. These are the same mine, mining laws that are intact today with supersized industrial scale mines. Um, I hear that the mining companies say, well, at least there was no loss of life during this disaster. Um, there was no loss of human life, um, but there were all kinds of impact to the ecosystem, including the long-term health of the humans that depend on the system. So it, it's, you know, really misleading for, for the company to be saying that. And, um, you know, this is, a, I always tell people that the disaster is ongoing because we are still dealing with the 24-7 pollution of our entire watershed by this mine. Um, this is not the only mine that's dumping into this watershed. There are others along the way that are also dumping into the watershed. And it's like the biggest story that people haven't heard of you know, mining impact. Um, the mining industry is very slick in terms of uh, keeping these stories under wraps. Uh, um, you know, I'm one person that can share some of the stories from our territory, but there are countless others who could tell you, you know, many more stories. So gold in particular is uh, something that we feel very strongly about that there should not be any more gold that needs to be mined. The amount of gold that's been mined in the history of the world and the impacts that the, that mining of gold particularly has had on Indigenous peoples has been vital. That's why I don't wear gold. I, I refuse to wear gold. Um, I encourage others in my family uh, to, to stop purchasing new gold and, um, you know, because it, it, it has, I don't know which territory it came from. I don't know which people had to be sacrificed for me to wear that gold ring, for me to wear those gold earrings. It's not worth it to me. You know, how much water uh, was poisoned for, for that piece of jewelry, you know, for, for vanity, um, for a luxury item. It's not worth it to me. Um, so some of the things that I've been um, uh, involved in in the last year is kind of looking at, well, what are some options to this? Um, one of the uh, leading organizations that I've had the pleasure to work with is IRMA, the Initiative for Responsible Mining Assurance. And um, this is really uh, something that I would encourage others to look into. I think it's an excellent tool for communities and Indigenous people to, to get on the IRMA now to show that we are paying attention to higher standards and um, that uh, you know that there are 
things that we can do to make things more responsible, to acknowledge Indigenous rights. You know, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples really lays out a good framework for, um, you know, understanding what Indigenous people are asking for. It was worked on over 20 years at the United Nations by Indigenous peoples from all over the world. Um, and this is something that Canada has uh, said that they adopt, but um, the governments are saying that it would be incrementally implemented, which doesn't really make much sense to us because that's basically spoon feeding us um, our human rights, you know, a, a few rights at a time, which is kind of crazy to us. So when we're talking about um, uh, that declaration, one of the things that comes up most often is consent and um, having free prior informed consent from Indigenous peoples so that there's no coercion, there's no um, forced relocation, um, that we are um, acknowledged as real, full human beings, which, um, you know, having to have this declaration to state that shows the state of the world that we're in of how Indigenous peoples and Indigenous lands have just been simply taken. Um, and so when we're talking about consent, I, I you know, people, um, government or uh, corporate interests often say, well, we don't really understand what that means. <laughs> so I always say, well, if you think, okay, uh, think about uh, the... The situation I mostly come up with when dealing with corporate interest is usually it's, uh, we'll say, an older white man representing the corporation and an Indigenous woman representing the Indigenous community. Um, if you don't have my consent in a relationship, it's not about consultation. I'm not just going to let you know what I want to do and what I want to take and then just take it. It's about consent between having a long-term invested relationship, not a transactional, you know, um, operation that's happening. So then it, it makes it a lot clearer about what we're talking about. It, it, consent is not a complex issue. Um, when I hear the term operationalizing consent, it actually makes me feel kind of sick. We have so many missing and murdered Indigenous women out of our communities that are impacted by large-scale corporate um, mining operations. We have these man camps that are coming in. Um, and these um, operations use poverty against our community members to, um, you know, it's the only job in town. And it's not that people necessarily support what's happening on the lens it's because they have no other option and that poverty is being leveraged against them. So these, these are some of the complexities that we have to deal with as Indigenous peoples. Um, there, are, you know, there are so many um, different mining disasters that are happening. Um, there are all kinds of reports coming out from um, different mining engineers saying, you know, it's not a matter of, you know, if, it's when. Um, we've seen uh, major disasters in Brazil, in uh, uh, San Marco, um, in Brumadino, um, and you know it, it needs to it needs to be acknowledged. So that when you're thinking about you're talking about responsible jewelry sourcing, when you're thinking about gold, please remember these stories and think about whose land they came from, which people were um, impacted by this, and you know do you really need that luxury item? That's a um, powerful story. Thank you, Ms. Mata. Um, so for the rest of the panel, I, I see there's some questions coming in in the chat and I um, encourage folks who are listening who have questions for Ms. Mata or Peter or me um, to feel free to ask. I have a few questions, so I thought I would just kick it off. Um, I This is... Uh, this is a, it's an interesting time um, from the perspective of the U.S. with the um, election having been completed um, and um, a lot of people, you know, really thinking about um, authoritarianism and the impacts of government oppression. And I wonder if, um, if you could talk a little bit about some of the ways and in, in, in shape of government oppression from your experience Ms. Mata, and then maybe Peter, if you can follow with um, some of the risks to, to people who are fighting for their land or their rights um, in your research. Sure. Um, so government oppression, I mean, this is um, 
uh, a lot of people don't realize that uh, a large parts of uh, British Columbia, especially, but large parts of uh, Canada are unceded uh, lands. They are still sovereign lands under the control of Indigenous peoples, but they're occupied by the Canadian government. Um, my territory here, Sukhapu Ulu, where I am right now, um, is one of those uh, one of those nations that have unceded lands. We've never been conquered in war. We've never uh, surrendered any lands through treaty. Um, you know, none of those things have happened. So we're we are illegally occupied. And when we stand up for our rights, when when we push back against these um, uh, corporate interests, we are met with military force. Um, if you look through the history of Canada, uh, the police were established to uh, oppress the indigenous peoples because we come from very rich land. Um, you know, uh, this is seeing this today. Uh, you look at what's happening um, across Indigenous nations in, in Canada. Um, you have the Mi'kmaq out in Nova Scotia, modern day Nova Scotia, who are facing, um, uh, you know, criminalization and in incredible oppression over the lobster fishery. Um, you have lands being taken from the Haudenosaunee at Six Nations just outside of Toronto, Ontario, that they have dug the, the land and said no more. Um, you know, you've had um, we've had all kinds of different uh, roadblocks last year in, in this last year uh, that Indigenous people have called shut down Canada in solidarity with the um, other nations across the country that are facing, um, you know, not only large mining um, line, mining projects that are going through without our consent, but also oil and gas, fish farms. Um, all kinds of things that are happening because we come from rich territories and that our rights uh, in many cases, if they're protected by treaty rights in some of the other parts of Canada are equal to the crown and sovereign nations, indigenous peoples here who have never ceded any of those lands are equal to or above, we say above the crown because we never, we're the original people of this land and we are still here. And we know our rights and we still have our governance systems and we still have our languages that tell us what the laws of this land are. So when we're coming up against these big um, corporate government interests in our lands, that's where we have the conflict. That's where we have the military brought in against us. So this is not something that's only happening in other places. Canada is one of the uh, leading countries for um, uh, mining companies being registered in the world. Canada claims to have some of the best mining laws in the world, if not the best mining laws in the world, that um, respects Indigenous rights, and that's simply not true. So <clears throat> we're facing a lot here. So I can add a little bit more of a, uh, a global perspective to that. Uh, each year, uh, for the last uh, several years, uh, Global Witness publishes uh, a report on um, the killings of land and environmental defenders, many of which are Indigenous people. Uh, and over the years, the number of uh, people, uh, land def defenders that have been killed has increased significantly, um, uh, as well as the criminalization of their activities. Um, and uh, what we're finding is that um, Latin America, uh, is consistently uh, one of the most dangerous places for land and environmental defenders. And uh, this year, uh, for the second year in a row, mining uh, is uh, uh, the deadliest sector. Uh, so those that are defending their land against mining, comp mining operations um, are at most a uh, threat. Um, the... Uh, the, you talked about the uh, sort of the new populist movements <laughs> around some of the uh, uh, country, in countries around the world. Uh, uh, in, in the study that we just did, uh, we looked uh, very carefully at Brazil. Uh, Brazil uh, has a new administration, well, not a new administration, Bolsonaro's administration is there, which has rolled back a number of the protections for the environment and for indigenous people. Interestingly, Brazil is the only country in Latin America where uh, mining uh, is not allowed, legally allowed, on indigenous lands. However, uh, a new bill uh, is winding its way through the legislature, which would open up indigenous lands uh, to not just mining, but uh, uh, all sorts of extraction, uh, as well as uh, other developments, dams, roads, rails, things like that. 
Uh, that's uh, really important because Brazil holds uh, 60% of the Amazon basin. Uh, and uh, much of the uh, much of the uh, uh, indigenous lands in Brazil are actually covered uh, with concessions that have been carved out by governments. They haven't been allocated yet, uh, but uh, they they exist. Um, and so uh, there's a, a real chance that if this law passes, there will be a significant uptick. Uh, in the amount of mining that takes place on indigenous land. So we're all watching very carefully the, 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 the bill uh, in, in Brazil right now. Yeah, it's, uh, I, this, I mean, the, the risks of impacts and the vulnerability is, um, is so enormous and um, you know, dis discussing rights and oppression, um, and I want to go back to a comment uh, or a, a piece of Nuskmata's story about the Mont Pali mine waste disaster when the tailings dam collapsed. And I was thinking about um, when you were talking about how there, the industry says, well, there was no loss of life. But there was loss of livelihood. And I um, wonder um, if, if you could give each of you maybe a quick outline of some of the other possible risks from mining, just so we can have it all on the table. Um, sure. Um, one of the things that we're looking at right now um, uh, is that so we've got this like green energy transition um, where you know people are saying, well, we need to switch over to electric, we need to switch to solar, we need to switch to all in wind. Um, and looking at all of this, but not paying that much attention to making sure that the mining itself is clean. So if the mining is really dirty, then is that energy and, and the new technology really clean, right? So um, those are some of the things that I would encourage people, if you're not familiar with IRMA that I mentioned before, to take a look at uh, it's the highest standard that I've seen around mining. And it also incorporates consent from Indigenous peoples, not just consultation. Um, Consultation is a, is a slippery slope. Uh, that's something that people use a lot, especially in government. Um, you know, you get back to this relationship. Um, that you don't just consult somebody um, to see it. You know, just, well, I'm just checking in with you, letting you know this is what we're going to do. Uh, so now that we've consulted with you, we're going to do it even though, you know, you don't want that. You don't give your consent. Um, these are some of the things that we're dealing with on the daily Um Indigenous peoples are um, often, uh, you know, we, we are systematically um, held in poverty by systems. Uh, in, in Canada, we have the Indian Act, uh, we have reserve systems, um, small parcels, parcels of land. Um, you know, there, there are so many different intersecting pieces that combine with like the mining laws, that combine with the, the use of the RCMP and the military to control Indigenous peoples, um, the poverty. Um, you know, there's that systematic racism. Um, and a lot of these things are really coming out now. People are speaking about them, largely led by the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States um, that has um, come into uh, Canada as well, people supporting that. And the, the movement acknowledging, <clears throat> excuse me, acknowledging Indigenous peoples as well, saying, you know, um, yes, our lives matter and we all live on stolen lands of Indigenous peoples. You know, these are um, these are conversations that are important in these discussions when you're you're talking about indigenous rights, because often what we're talking about are human rights and the history of indigenous peoples is the history of everybody. It's not just our history. You know, I, I tell people we're all colonized. You know, we're all part of this system, this oppressive system. Um, the difference between, um, you know, myself and, and a non-indigenous person is that um, I still come from, I know where I come from in my, my homelands here and have a direct bloodline responsibility to this land because I know this is where I am from. Like my body, my bones are made from the salmon and the moose and the water and the plants of this territory. It's in my DNA. Um, so the, uh, a, lot of, a lot of the different uh, things that we're talking about are very intersected. It, it intersects with, um, uh, you know, right down to our, our language, our place names. It comes down to control and care over our own children. It comes down to con control and care over our own water, our food sources, um, our medicines. You know, because we are directly 
connected to the land because we are uh, still in in our community groups that we're still um, know where our home villages are we we have a very different context of when we're dealing with it with the state you know we have a very different context when we're dealing with the land around us so um, some of those things are, are really important to to consider when you're thinking about the bigger picture of where indigenous people are coming from like we're coming from our homelands we're not coming from anywhere else and we're not going anywhere else and I always like to tell people you know what um, the genocide really did um, is that it strengthened it strengthened us because the strongest of the strong survived and we're the descendants of those people and our kids are even tougher and stronger and smarter than we are so you know uh, I think it's about time that we start working together collaboratively on climate change working together on protecting water working together on protecting food and really um, you know kind of getting over all of this colonial um, craziness and this this gold fever mentality and um, you know coming together um, really as human beings because our very survival depends on it. So I'm not sure if I answered your question, just kind of went off, but uh, those are the things that are on my mind these days. It's really powerful. Um, so a couple of questions have come in um, that I caught in the chat. Um, one uh, was about, um, for Nuskamata, what other mining companies besides Imperial Metals? And another uh, referenced um, the unique role of Canadian mining companies. And maybe, Peter, you could talk a little bit about, um, about, the, about how the mining industry is structured and why Canadian mining companies are in so many places in Latin America. Do you want to go first, Peter, and then we go to Ms. Mata to talk about other companies in her territory? Uh, yeah, let me try it out. Can you hear me now? Here, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, Canadian companies, uh, Australian companies, those are some of the major companies um, uh, that are operating around the world. Um, I actually work most of my time in, in Africa uh, and Canadian mining companies um, are, are, are dominant in many of the countries, especially around gold. Uh, we've been working in Tanzania for uh, 10, 20 years now. Um, and Barrick Gold, for example, a Canadian company there holds some of the richest uh, um, mining lands in, in, the, in the country, helped make Tanzania uh, one of the major, uh, one of the world's major gold producers, along with uh, uh, Ghana. Um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, it it is uh, uh, it it is it is very hard um, uh, for uh, indigenous people and other communities um, to effectively uh, monitor. Uh, the uh, company behavior uh, on on their lands, and I should say that um, in Africa and in many other places, uh, even though indigenous people hold land rights, uh, they don't necessarily uh, hold uh, the rights to high value natural resources on or under their land. So that means that governments can easily allocate mining concessions and oil concessions and uh, 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 logging concessions and trophy hunting concessions uh, on top of uh, indigenous lands uh, with uh, at best uh, consultation, mm -hmm. but very rarely um, uh, consent. Um, one of the concerns that we have is that uh, in the absence of effective uh, company performance, um, uh, uh, and in the absence of uh, governments uh, uh, unwilling or unable to effectively monitor mining uh, activities, that uh, many of these communities are taking action on their own. Um, and uh, that could get very dangerous very quickly, as I uh, was reporting, as I mentioned about the Global Witness Report. Um, we, we don't think <laughs> communities ought to take law enforcement into their own hands, obviously, even though many of them I feel like they need to because of the the, the reluctance or absence of government uh, actions. Um, we believe that uh, in addition to consent, uh, companies, if indigenous people want 
to uh, develop a partnership with a company, uh, there ought to be uh, 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 better benefit sharing arrangements between indigenous people and companies or any sort of miners that are operating on their, their land. Um, and indigenous people, I think, would benefit from having uh, 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 more skills and more information about how to negotiate effectively uh, with some of these companies that bring in their um, uh, that, that obviously have quite a bit of negotiating agreements. Many of the agreements that we've seen between uh, communities and uh, mining companies are, are very one-sided. Uh, and uh, uh, as uh, it was just mentioned, uh, the value, uh, uh, indigenous people ought to have a lot more power and they do have, they should have a lot more power because the, the minerals are on their land. Uh, so we're looking for um, fair benefit sharing agreements, uh, fair uh, opportunities to negotiate. Yeah, that's uh, something that we've had to uh, deal with in our territory. Um, to, to answer the direct question about other mining companies in our territory, uh, we have a very large territory. Um, the one uh, mining operation that's closest to me right now is Chisico Mines, Gibraltar. Um, Chisico uh, is part of a, uh, a lot of their owners um, actually specialize in low quality gold mines, low um, concentrations, which means that it's a bigger mine to get the gold um, uh, with a lot more uh, pollution, a lot more damage. They actually dump, uh, Tosico Gibraltar dumps directly into the Fraser River, um, just above my village where we fish, actually. Um, I haven't fished there personally for many years because of the pollution and because of the heavy metals contamination in our river. Um, so I am really lucky that I have coastal connections as well. Um, to get my salmon, to feed my family. Um, we also have Barkerville Gold Mines, which is just north of Pisico, Gibraltar. And the, that combined with the Mount Polly Mine creates a triangle within 100 kilometers, three major mines in 100 kilometers of each other on the same river in the, in the same watershed. We also have Newmont Gold and numerous um, other um, like dozens and dozens of exploration companies um, in our territory, as well as uh, thousands of plaster claims in our territory as well. And when we brought a map that we created uh, with all of these claims on them to the Ministry of Energy and Mines in, um, you know, to, to speak with them about these issues, they asked us, where did you get this map? <laughs> we said, we created it. We asked you for this map, but you don't have this information. So we pieced it together, claim by claim, archaeology overlays, village site overlays, and you could tell where villages had been wiped out um, because of the, the the gold rush in the area and the ongoing gold rush that's happening and continues today. So yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a really dire situation. Yeah. One of the um, uh, questions in the chat from earlier in the panel was uh, how um, participants here can um, listen in on future panels or stay in touch. And I thought maybe I could start by listing some of the resources that we've mentioned. Um, you know, in this era of COVID, uh, I, I've noticed a, quite a proliferation of um, webinars and um, probably the best way to stay in touch is um, to follow or join the organizations that um, uh, like the um, Chicago Responsible Jewelry Initiative that are putting together these types of discussions. Um, some of the topics that we mentioned that are, are worth following. Um, the missing and murdered Indigenous women issue is an enormous issue. And it's um, there There are web, several websites dedicated to the issue. Um, you can just look it up. It's also very prolific on social media um, communities and Indigenous peoples um, throughout uh, North America, um, in particular, where this um, uh, where the the where missing and murdered murdered indigenous women is becoming a movement demanding change from extractive industries in North America. It's not unlike anywhere else in the world. The same thing is happening everywhere. Um, but um, you can follow missing and murdered indigenous women online, or I mean, 
that's a terrible thing to follow, but you can look it up online and stay in touch with the issue and find ways to help in communities where specific initiatives are underway. Um, I think it was mentioned earlier, Global Witness is an organization doing a terrific job tracking the global human rights abuses, um, which are, are cropping up all over the place. Um, uh, Nuskmata mentioned um, the Initiative for Responsible Mining Assurance, um, which is uh, advancing a, a framework that we think is the best in practice for, for better mining practices. Um, IRMA, as, as it's called, has just struck a partnership with the Alliance for Responsible Mining, which is um, doing similar work, but focused on artisanal mining. There was a question in the chat about artisanal mining. Um, and um, ARM, the Alliance for Responsible Mining, is focused on uh, the best practices standards for artisanal mining or small scale mining. IRMA is focused on best practices for large scale mining. So in a place like Brazil or Democratic Republic of Congo or where you've got a lot large overlay between industrial scale mining and small scale mining, um, we hope that the it working in partnership, we can we can foster um, better practices in those in those kinds of um, environments. My organization is called Earthworks. We've been tracking mining for over 30 years. Um, it's pretty easy to find us online. Peters, uh, the World Resources Institute. Um, and uh, Nuskmata, First Nations Advocating for Responsible Mining, I, I just think is an outstanding resource. Uh, First Nations Women Advocating for Responsible Mining, FN Warm, is an outstanding resource in British Columbia. Um, and then Nuskmata, Peter, I don't know if you have other resources you'd like to offer the group. <coughs> A lot of what I, I work with is uh, uh, mostly now, mostly front lines, indigenous communities who are really pushing back on, um, you know, on projects that are consent. Um, I would also say to, you know, really get educated about where you are, whose territory you live in, because if you live anywhere in the Americas, uh, you live in somebody's territory. Um, uh, there are a lot of different organizations who are leading that work. There are lots of opportunities for volunteering or for donating to different work that's happening. Um, but also there's a lot of information online just about learning where you are and what the, what the current Indigenous issues are. So if you're part of that, and you're part of the solution, right? So, um, I would encourage you to get to know where you are locally as well. Yeah, I think um, uh, for for land rights specifically, or a land and natural resource rights, there there are a number of groups that are working on these issues. Uh, not just uh, WRI, but uh, there's a group called the uh, uh, Rights and Resources Initiative (RRI). Uh, there is the International Land Coalition based in uh, Rome. Uh, that's a, a a coalition of several hundred. Um, uh, indigenous and community organizations uh, from around the world. Um, I, depending on what country you're, you might be interested in, there are, there are usually a number of well, NGO civil society organizations that are uh, focused on indigenous uh, land issues, indigenous rights issues more broadly. Um, so uh, in, in Brazil, for example, there's a group called ISA, um, there in, uh, in, in Peru, there's a group called IBC. Um, so I, I would encourage you to do some, uh, or in Paraguay, there's a group called FAPI uh, that spends uh, most of its time working on indigenous land rights issues. And, and, and these land rights issues are, are key uh, to uh, maintaining the traditional territory that uh, these groups have held. So uh, I would encourage you to do some uh, research on uh, country-specific organizations as well. I think you're muted, Jennifer. Oh. I don't, I'm not, I doesn't say I'm muted. Um, can I now you're start? okay, now you're okay. Oh, okay, sorry about that. Um, there's a, a interesting question in the chat. You mentioned earlier about um, increased um, demand of gold right now in, in the market for gold where it is right now. And 
Somebody's asking about uh, uh, increased purchasing of gold by central banks and investors. I wonder if you could speak a little bit to what's happening in the market for gold right now besides um, jewelry. Was that a question for me? It was. Uh, uh, for either of you. <laughs> Who's buying gold and why? <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I, I mentioned earlier that the price of gold really uh, spiked in August. Um, I think there were a couple of reasons for that. Uh, one was the, um, uh, you know, as the stock market was plummeting <laughs> with the uh, with the pandemic, uh, uh, P, uh, investors fled uh, from the stock market to uh, the perceived security of gold. I think a lot of... Um, uh, government uh, stimulus packages, economic stimulus packages, uh, also uh, kept the interest rate down low. So, so that had an effect as well. What we saw um, a, a relationship uh, as the price of gold went up, uh, the amount of uh, 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 illegal uh, reported illegal gold mining activity uh, in uh, the Amazon spiked as well. Um, and so uh, we saw, I, I mean, I, uh, the price of gold has, uh, has since come down a bit, as you all probably know better than I do. Um, uh, and that's as people are moving back into the stock market, I, I suppose. But uh, this illegal mining is a, a major concern of, and uh, in, in, in the Amazon basin specifically, um, because uh, some of these uh, illegal mining operations are not uh, artisanal or small scale mining in the Yanomamo territory, for example, in northern Brazil or in, in and in southern uh, Venezuela. Uh, some of these illegal mining operations are quite significant, bringing in heavy equipment, uh, even uh, 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 building airstrips to uh, bring uh, bring in uh, 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 equipment and and flying out the gold. So some of these are, are not small scale operations. Um, equally important is that uh, more more and more we are seeing uh, drug cartels uh, taking over some of the gold mining operations, uh, taking uh, advantage of the um, poor, uh, many times the poor poor people who are actually involved in the illegal mining operations. It's a way for uh, drug uh, drug money to be uh, funneled. Uh, and cleaned, if you like. So the link between organized crime and uh, illegal mining operations is quite significant in in, uh, in the in the Amazon basin. <clears throat> you know, another question came in um, asking about uh, uh, placer mining and um, so-called self-collected gold, which is marketed in the U.S. as more responsible and less impactful. And you mentioned plaster mining in, um, in, in your territory and, and region. Ms. Kavada, can you talk a little bit about the impacts of plaster mining? Sure. Um, so the plaster mining is a uh, smaller scale. That's worth thinking. Um, like some people will go out as, as hobbyists um, you know, with, with gold pans. Most often, though, what I've seen in our territory is larger scale, you're using, you know, heavy equipment, um, you're using um, industrial sluice boxes, which basically washes the, you know, um, you're taking all of the um, the rock um, and the, the dirt and you're kind of washing it through the gold's heavier so it drops down. Um, but what we're finding is where um, a lot of the areas that were previously mined are being remined for plaster. Um, and uh, what they used to use before to help pull out the gold is mercury. So we're seeing a uh, reactivation of mercury in the waterways again. Of course, mercury is very toxic. Um, and so we've got a lot of concerns about that. But it's also disrupting fish habitat. You know, it's disrupting uh, creeks. It's disrupting um, the, the rivers in our territory. Uh, we have a very high value on salmon. Uh, it's uh, it's a cultural keystone piece, a species. It's not just, you know, protein on a plate, but it also represents a lot of other different ecosystems that depend on it. The forests depend on it. Um, uh, you know, we need clean water. There's a lot of integrated things that I, I spoke of 
earlier. Um, but the plaster mining is something that, you know, is also being um, made more popular with uh, TV shows like Gold Rush and um, other places where it's still this romanticized idea of getting rich, um, you know, like, uh, you know, striking gold. Uh, you think about how we use the word gold in our language as this, you know, the gold standard, you know, treat them like gold, all of these things. And when I think of gold, when I hear gold, I think of polluted water and, you know, people being murdered in Mexico and, um, you know, uh, the, the history of colonization in the Americas. That's what comes to mind when I think of gold. So whether it's plaster, uh, and exploration. There's so many uh, drill holes in our territory. Like our mountains look like Swiss cheese with drill holes. Um, and then we have the large scale mines as on top of that. So um, people think that it's it's benign, but when you add it all up, it's death by a thousand cuts in our territory, and all of those impacts add up together. So it's a, it's an issue as well. Well, we're reaching the top of the hour. Um, I think, you know, I mean, this has just been an incredible conversation. Thank you, Peter and Nismata. I wonder if we can close it out. Um, we've got uh, uh, 47 people listening who care about this issue. Um, what, what can we do? What would be the top three things that you would have a concerned jeweler and consumer of mined minerals do at this time? One, one quick thing for me is, um, honestly, is to uh, stop purchasing gold. Um, stop purchasing gold and learn more about that story. Learn more about where it comes from. Uh, learn more about the impacts of it so that you can share that information with other people. Um, you know, remember my story about gold fever, um, you know, and the impacts that it has, the ongoing impacts that it has. It, it's scary that during a pandemic that people are looking to gold to secure the future. <laughs> it's really the, probably one of the most destructive, um, one of the most, most destructive things that has ever happened to the history of, of, uh, of our world. Uh, when you look at the wars that it's driven, the pollution that it's driven, um, and that that continues. So please, for my simple thing is just, just stop on it. Um, I would just uh, add that uh, there are uh, certification programs um, that are that have been established for a number of products, um, or commercial products. Um, you know the, the the blood diamonds and things like that that has helped uh, address some of those issues. I I think that uh, uh, in in Latin America certainly uh, a, a gold certification program would certainly help. Uh, so uh, jewelers can understand where uh, they source their gold uh, and whether that's done uh, in accordance with international social and environmental safeguards. Uh, mention was made of the, uh, the uh, human rights uh, and indigenous rights uh, international standards earlier on. Um, uh, there are a number of uh, 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 standards that, are, that have been established for uh, companies and, and for uh, indigenous, uh, re respecting indigenous land rights and so on. So I, I would encourage this uh, push for a, a certification program um, uh, uh, to, to allow you to understand where the goal comes from. Very good, thank you. And then the two that we mentioned earlier that are worth checking out, um, uh, the Initiative for Responsible Mining Assurance and the Alliance for Responsible Mining and keep track. The more, the more you know, the less gold glows, as we say. Um, well, uh, I'm not sure, Andrea and Susan, um, I think at this point we give it back to you because another panel is going to come in on this line. Um, maybe one of you can tell us what you want us to do now. I just want to thank you all. <laughs> because this has been an incredible conversation, an important conversation. And it can be stressful to some people in the jewelry industry, and I'm certainly of the industry, about the idea that using gold uh, could be immoral. But we have to think about it. And it's not just, you know, if it's just about money, if it's not about lives, then where's the value in that? So you guys brought that home so very clearly for us. And I really 
really appreciate that. And I know Susan does too. She's probably trying to turn her camera on now to tell you. Her anyway, thank you. Thank All right. you. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.